Hey, I can't come to the phone right now. Please leave a message after this podcast. Before we continue my first ever journey through the Harry Potter series, just a few quick announcements. First, time is running out to see Multitude Live in Boston on October 10th. For tickets, go to multitude.productions live. I will be doing a segment called Percy colon so good the worst. And my guest will be Helen Zaltzman. We will be discussing whether or not Percy Weasley is the worst or if he's actually so good. And the weekend after that, I'll be at LeakyCon Boston. Things have moved around a little bit. Potterless Live will be on Saturday at two on the main stage. And I will also be part of a Harry Potter podcast panel on Friday on the main stage as well. So I'll be doing stuff those two days if you want to see me and stay tuned on social media for the announcement about the Potterless meetup. And speaking of conventions, I will be at another one. I will be at Conjuration in Atlanta, Georgia, November 15th through 17th. I'll be doing Potterless Live with Brian from Draco and the Malfoys. I'll also be doing a panel about how to make podcasts. It's going to be a great time. I'm super excited about it. If you want to get tickets and learn a little bit more about the convention, go to conjurationcon.com. And speaking of things that make me really happy, we've new patrons to welcome to the team. So shout out to Jaden Guttery, Emily, Rajitze Larson, Joe Vito Mubri, Ritwick Siddhartha Devar Karuni, Peggy Murphy, Hannah Hagen, Maura Blutt, Kat Cuseo, Steph Zamowski, and Natalie Ubbin. Shout out to Siobhan Ellsbury, Farzan Garabat, Nancy Della Pena, and Jessica Barr, who all upgraded their pledge. A shout out to Six Awkward Nine, who upgraded to the producer level status, as well as our new producer level patrons, Tuzi Trin, Anthony Ruiz, and Peter Mina. They joined the ranks of Vicky, Aaron, Jesse, Natalie, Clow, Frank, Marchismo, Samantha, Juan, Abid, Rosemary, Maria, Lisa, Rumina, Kamel, Russell, Audra, Eleanor, Rossanne, Nikita, Taylor, Ali, Amelia, Sean, Sarah, Ben, Rachel, Zachary, Orchid, Vivian, Takari, Haley, Moster, Angelina, Alex, Brian, Caitlin, Grace, Raul, Ingen, Mari, Alex, John, Noel, Tao, Emily, Robin, Will, Liz, Mariah, Brandon, Sarah, Claire, Rory, Gloria, Sarah, Patrick, Ali, Cat, Veronica, Lada, Noah, Tracy, Colleen, Jennifer, Friday, Ivor, Naomi, Tyler, Summer, Heather, Vera, Carrie, Andrea, Ella, Anthony, David, Elisa, Lynn, Cameron, Justin, Christine, Jacob, Toothless, Maya, Mark, Polly, Srujan, Ned, Remy, Sarah, Nona, Zena, Harlan, Noelia, Addy, Brian, Jenny, Nikki, Kara, Courtney, Kine, Amanda, Sabrina, Alicia, Kafir, Lindy, Martha, Benjamin, Sky, Mart, Sarah, Marta, Stephanie, Justine, Aaron, CJ, Eileen, Violet, Cat, Lindsay, Fielding, Keegan, Miranda, Gail, Mr. Folk, Heather, Adam, Chris. Christina, Maya, Zachary, Kieran, Heaven, Christy, Lily, Wire Warrior, Floor, Siri, Georgia, Itzel, Al, Topher, Peter, Candy, Skyla, Adele, Professor Threat, Kelsey, Ellie, Lubin, Maleo, Lena, Daniel, Lee, 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 Elizabeth, Abby, Lika, Michael, Earmuffs, Kara, Tiffany, Kelly, Nadia, Andrea, Carrie, Jamie, Camillo, Connie, Janet, Mary, Emo, Anastasia, Jaden, Nedry, Matt, Riley, Will, Zephyr, Artemis, Brett, Samantha, Kayla, Lauren, Aurora, Emma, Hermani, Lior, Megan, Out of Context, Liam, Melena, Marcos, Ella, Hannah, Courtney, Victoria, Marie, Ashton, Brittany, Phelan, Julie, The Meadows Family, Jennifer, Anna, Fake, Brianna, Carutera, Sarah, McKenna, and esteemed nuggets, can't I, Potter? And yes, I can. Who never forget to stretch before physical activity and then tweak their back doing something not that physically intense. If you want to be like one of these amazing patrons and get access to exclusive live streams, exclusive merchandise, director's commentary, bonus episodes, you can head on over to patreon.com slash Potterless. But without further ado, let's get into episode 96 of Potterless, covering the first part of the film adaptation of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, guest starring my sister, Megan Fruhoff, and her husband, Travis Fruhoff. Welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the tale of a grown man who just finished reading the Harry Potter series for the very first time and is now watching all of the films. My name is Mike Schuber. I'm that grown man, and I'm here joined today by two very special guests. It is my sister and past guest, Megan Fruhoff, and her husband, Travis Fruhoff. Fam, how's it going? Oh, so good. Hello, world. <laughs> Hello, Michael. <laughs> Thank you for having us. <laughs> I am glad that you are here to discuss the second film, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, which is really good, isn't it? <laughs> oh, easily the shortest straw of the bunch of the Harry Potter movies. I know. And I, I was trying to reminisce as I watched this movie this week. I think I saw this thing maybe 10 or 12 years ago when I was trying <laughs> to actually court your sister, Michael. Ooh. I was I, I was willing, I was day. willing to bite the bullet and, and dive into the Harry Potter world and only the movie format. But uh, yes, I, I can't wait to get into this atrocity that we call a movie. <laughs> and let's just be reminded that when Travis courted me, it wasn't typical that everyone had text messages. So mm -hmm. that's how far back our courting goes. <laughs> <laughs> and how far back this movie was filmed, which definitely shows as we were watching it. Yeah, not everything has aged incredibly well. Oh, the special effects. Oh, 
My God. <laughs> Terminator 2, I think, had better special effects <laughs> than Harry Potter, the, the Chamber of Secrets. The spell casting wand work was... It was something else. Clearly <laughs> primitive computer technology. Uh, we're getting ahead technology. of ourselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Reel us in, Mike. Yes. So as we are doing for all of these movie episodes. It's one guest who has read the books and seen the movies, which is Megan and Travis, who has only seen the movies. I do want to point out that specifically for this movie, when I was originally reading the books and going through the series, I would read a book and then immediately watch the movie before going on to the next one. So when I was watching the second movie with Kelly all the way back in Houston, before I even lived in Seattle, we were trying to watch the movie together because we would hang out at nights when we were both off of work. And I fell asleep while we were trying to watch this movie three different times. <laughs> and the problem is Kelly would be so engrossed by it that she wouldn't notice that I had fallen asleep until it was over. <laughs> I'm literally biting my tongue because I want you to finish, but it took us three times, me yeah. three times. We both <laughs> fell asleep yeah. during one of the sessions. Uh, we had to push our original recording date or we were going <laughs> to rush to get this done based on the I fact that... I cannot believe that movie was yeah. three hours yeah. or however long yeah. it was. Yeah, this one was two hours and 40 minutes, as was the first one and I can't believe that both of these are so long I can't either I mean they wasted so much in the beginning and the very end scene Ugh. which I'm sure we will cover oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> aka the gem of the movie <laughs> the last five fucking minutes of <laughs> clapping for Hagrid <laughs> It takes so long. I was like, did they do that in the book? Did Hagrid even matter? I don't think so. Ask myself the same question. But yeah, let's <laughs> let's get into it. Let's start at the beginning because we definitely are getting ahead of ourselves. Yes. And as we will be doing for the movie episodes, a lot of my notes will be things that were different between the books and the movies. And then Travis can get to realize how like the book, even though this is my least favorite of the books in the series, is better in a lot of different ways. Yeah. I tried to tell Travis that as we were watching the movie, I was like, this is easily the worst book and is going to be the worst movie but like jk realized it was the worst book and then was like hmm let's make it important by making things come back in the last book that were yeah. in this book i wonder if that was an intentional decision by jk to think ah that book wasn't so great ah i will make it little little nuggets of importance and then yeah. everyone in retrospect will be like oh wow the second book's really good if you ignore it and just note that there were some seeds planted yeah Ugh. exactly it was such a seed planter book. <laughs> I will say this, but when Meg told, or, you know, Mike, you reached out and asked for me to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I was reluctant, but here, I mean, we're, this is history in the making. How could you pass up on this, this opportunity <laughs> uh, to, to be part of Potterless? Uh, but then Megan quickly followed that up with, this is by far the worst book. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe I'm not so honored to be a part of the worst reviewed movie book We're like the rejects book, where Michael was like, I can't find another guest. Who should I? <laughs> I guess I'll just ask my sister again. <laughs> this is not the case. If anything, it is a compliment that if I'm having people discuss the worst thing, I need the best guests yeah. to bring it up. Anybody can talk about book six. Come on. <laughs> uh, I'm totally teasing. I'm totally teasing. You know I love being on this show. I hope other people like me being on it because clearly I'm on far too much. But people, I enjoy no, people it. People do love you. People do. Which, of course, I was scared because it's a thing with popular podcasts where sometimes people will just get their significant other or their siblings or their friends from college on and thankfully for the most part some of people's favorite guests are you kelly johnny and it's not just people saying oh she's only on because she's a sister yeah don't worry you're again and i'm like no i'm a fucking badass no. <laughs> <laughs> Travis just gave me a look like mm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's a movie. There is a and film. And <laughs> there's a chain full of secrets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're five minutes into the episode. Let's actually talk about the topic. <laughs> so one thing that is different between the books and the films, right off the bat, the movie starts with Harry going through his picture book and the Dursleys getting fancy for Vernon's co-workers coming over for some yeah, fancy yeah, yeah. dinner. And in the books, it actually starts with it being Harry's birthday again. And then there's a little more interaction between him and Dobby before this fateful dinner where the pudding drops on the lady's face, which is another thing that is different is that in the book, the pudding cake just kind of falls on the floor and gets on Harry. 
uh, not actually falling on the other lady, yeah. which makes it more dramatic. I think that's a fun change. I like that the fancy woman gets all covered in the pudding. It's, I think, a, a bit more comical. But also, like, so savage of Dobby to do that. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes that a more strange <laughs> He's decision. Like, hmm. Go to Harry Potter or I will ruin yeah, or go to move. don't go to Hogwarts or I will ruin your life. <laughs> savage move by Dobby. I mean, I was a little confused. I needed to I mean, this is how out of touch I am with this Harry Potter world. But I'm thinking, you know, are these his step parents on like were they forced to adopt this guy? Pretty I mean, much. the level of Eight in that house was was pretty much unmatched. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but here they are. They didn't want him in the house, and then they lock him up, for God's sakes, to not let him leave for school. All the parents in my world cannot wait for kids to go back to school <laughs> so they can stop being parents. So there, I, I didn't understand that Yeah, like drill in, the, drill in the uh, bars on the windows. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. like, wouldn't you mm-hmm. want him to escape and like... <laughs> Be rid of Get him. out of here. Go back to school. Yeah, like, exactly. That sounds ideal for all of us if you just like climb out of your window and leave but whatever Mm -hmm. we're not Mm -hmm. Vernon Dursley and also I was really pissed well I'm pissed off for two reasons one it always pisses me off didn't make Daniel Radcliffe wear green contacts I'm like he was allergic to them apparently oh okay because I was like okay like his eyes are fucking blue and like all you talk about it are how his eyes are fucking green can't he just wear contacts? But I guess that makes more sense. Well, the biggest thing that doesn't make any sense is that the whole thing with his eyes is that people keep saying that he has his mother's eyes. Yeah, and then, but then the, the actress, actress they get. <laughs> yeah, the actress that they get <laughs> for Lily brown eyes. has different color eyes. So like, Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding. Oh they don't get that actress until the last movie, but it's still, there's like a meme that goes around Too that late. says he has his mother's eyes and it's her and she has brown eyes and he has blue eyes and you're just like, what the fuck? Like, one job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, even if the color changes from green to blue, when you cast Harry's mom, be like, all right, we need someone with blue eyes, so at least it makes sense nobody's gonna burn the world down because the color's different but when you say when you say it's his mother's eyes it's not true you're at just all. like mm, no no he doesn't oh it's the shape <laughs> <laughs> i was also pissed that like dobby faded out yes that's a thing instead of operates like he does in the rest of the movies where he snaps mm-hmm. and he's fucking gone. He like faded out and I'm like, what the fuck was that? I don't remember that happening. <laughs> so it is different because in the books, it's a loud crack. Yes, as all apparition is. Yes, so it's a bigger deal. It was different, but the noise that they make when Dobby does it is so cool. I actually took a voice memo on my phone just to play because the sound effect is so sweet because it's got this like fade at the end. So it goes... <laughs> like this it sounds like a balloon letting out. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds pretty sweet, but yeah, it's very different. But one thing that I did enjoy about the Dursleys in this movie versus the first is that they get way campier and Vernon and Dudley and Petunia are so comically evil and so comically proper that it makes it really enjoyable. Like they really go to the next level of it and it's just the right amount of silly where it's over the top, but not too much where it is awkward to watch. Yeah, it's total like Trav was saying, like evil step parent. Mm -hmm. They were terrible type. Yeah, especially the father. Oh, my God. Yep. Not you're going to have to forgive me, everybody listening. <laughs> no, I, that's why you're on. That's the whole point. The names of these characters are going to elapse me. <laughs> so like, I'm, I'm going to use this stepfather when he comes in and uh, interrupts Harry trying to talk to Dobby and Dobby's locked in the closet. And he, Dobby keeps trying to open the door. He keeps shutting it, opening and shutting mm-hmm. it. Like, wouldn't anybody just look to see what the hell was going on inside that thing? <laughs> yeah. He said, yeah, he just He's says, just go like, fix mm, that fix door. That. Yeah. yeah, and you're like... Mm. I think it's broken. I think something's in there. <laughs> well, no, that's how furniture works. You know, when the cabinet doesn't work, it keeps trying to pop and open. And clearly that's, he that's wasn't trying to hide know. anything by keeping, like, keep closing it. Like, if anything, mm-hmm. Harry, just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that they do change about Dobby is that in the book, when Harry first comes upon Dobby, he's just sitting on Harry's bed quietly, and it's a more calm interaction. And in the movie, he's jumping on Harry's bed laughing hysterically, Yeah. which I don't know why they added that, but they made Dobby even more of a menace in the yeah. film. <laughs> even more annoying than he already was, which was pretty severely annoying. Right. It's The point is that he's supposed to be a pest, and that's the yeah. way he's written. But in the film, they're like, we need to make him even more of a pest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was like a little demon in the movie. (laughs) 
They came He's through. He's just like, fuck you, Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've got all your letters. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about Dobby that is interesting, though, is I feel like the CGI for Dobby weirdly held up way better than a lot of stuff. Like, I feel like he looked okay. There were a lot of things that were great. Like, the basilisk was good. Dobby was good. But, like, the spells coming out of the wands <laughs> was not great. Borderline questionable. <laughs> Like, not good at all. The CGI with Dobby didn't bother me. It was Dobby referring to himself in third person that bothered yeah, me. Yeah, that's this just would... the house elf thing. Oh. Yeah, he didn't understand that. <laughs> if you go back to the book two episodes of Potter List, that was one of my biggest gripes with him is just, okay, I can never stand third person people talking about themselves in the third person. It's, ugh, it's one of my biggest ugh. pet peeves. <laughs> They're supposed to be like, I don't know. They're a different creature. So they're like a combination of like being an animal. Just in case you forgot that. my name. <laughs> It's, I mean, that's a whole plot line of the book is yeah. how much should we care about them? And it comes back to bite Voldemort in the butt. But one thing that is actually different is that Dobby actually hints at Voldemort being the danger at the school. And that is not mentioned in the film at all when Dobby is trying to be alluding to why Harry shouldn't go back to the school. Oh, he does say like it's Voldemort in the book. I think he very briefly mentions that as a way to try to dissuade Harry from going, but it's just completely ignored in the film. No, in the film, he says bad things are happening at Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. Harry must not go back. That's all he says. Right. And finally, uh, for this opening scene, something that's different is that first, Vernon is not the one who installs the bars in the books. He hires somebody else to do it. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense because like Vernon clearly is not a very hands-on person. (laughs) And then they change the whole way that the twins come in to break Harry out because in the books, it's more drawn out. They come in, they have to pick the lock to where Harry's trunk is because Vernon's locked it in a closet. So they come in and pick the lock and then it's more drawn out. The time of day that it happens is different. In the book, it's in the morning, whereas in the movie, it's late at night. But then also in the movie, they add Vernon falling through the window just for comic yeah. relief. And like nobody cares that he just fell out a window. Like they're all just like, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, he had a lot of a big, comfortable bush placed directly under the window. So it's all good. Yeah, exactly. Like, thankfully, he didn't die because they were all just like, fly away. <laughs> <laughs> but. As they escape in the car, I couldn't help but notice that the car CGI is just rough. It's not great. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny. There are some good points and some just like, it's almost like two different people were working on the computer graphics. Like (laughs) they had one person in charge of spell work and another person in charge of like animals. (laughs) And like whoever was in charge of animals was really good. And whoever was in charge of like the sparks that come out of wands was like a three-year-old. It literally (laughs) reminded me of the, the final scene in the original Willy Wonka where that thing blasts up through the glass and explodes and they're floating over London. I mean, that is what the car looked like. I mean, and that was made in the 70s. I mean, it's like actually like a tiny model that they were just filming. It wasn't even computer graphics. Oh my goodness. Fred and George and Ron get Harry and Hedwig and all the stuff and they get in the Ford Anglia and go to the burrow. First of all, since when does the burrow have pigs? They're <laughs> way too poor for that. Otherwise, like they would be eating bacon all the time. Mm. Like that was all new to me because this is technically the first time you're seeing the burrow in the movie. Yes. And I don't remember Ron ever having livestock, just <laughs> fucking gnomes <laughs> and like a ghoul. Yep. Also, the Weasley clock is different. They've added more things to the Weasley clock and it doesn't make sense because one of them is dentist, which is why. Wild. Like, that's absolutely ridiculous that they would have a thing on the clock that's like, oh, man, we got to figure out where the family is. The dentist. You go twice a year? And isn't <laughs> Britain's whole thing that they have bad teeth? So do they even go to the dentist? <laughs> and also they're magical. So, like, I really don't think they go to the dentist. Yeah. Because, like, Hermione has to explain what dentists mm-hmm. are. At the slug club meeting. Yeah, at the slug club meeting. She's like, um, they tend to people's teeth. And they were all like, mm-hmm. That's what magic's for. Yep. (laughs) But one thing that is really good about these Burrow scenes is Arthur and Molly. They are just absolutely incredible. Yeah. They 
are portrayed so well and so lovingly. And Molly does the classic. She yells at Fred and George and Ron for taking the car and being late and all this other stuff, but then turns to Harry and is really nice to him, which used to happen to me growing up all the time. Yeah. Yell at someone else, but not at their friend. But then you have to stand there awkwardly while your friend gets yelled at by their parents. Do they use the same like bro? Did it look different to you than like the later books? Because I feel like it looks like different. I think they change it up a couple of times throughout the films. I feel like in this one, it felt a little smaller and a little yeah. more a little more like kitschy. messy and like Mitch. Yes, kitschy, like mismatched and like maybe brighter. I feel like I, I don't know. It looked different than I remember in like the sixth book when, you know, Ginny and Harry are like meet on the stairs and she ties his shoelace for some <laughs> It looked like a nice plot Weird of land. Weird-ass reason. I, yeah. I mean, it looked like a nice plot of land. It's all, yeah, it's definitely and a nice plot what, of land. What, what do the Weasley or Ron's parents do for a living? Like Ma, Ron's mom is a is a stay-at-home mom, and his dad like works in the ministry. They're supposed to be poor, but like have a decently big house, but it's supposed to be like, you know. Haphazardly put together. Yeah, hap, yeah it's supposed huh. to be kind of like they keep magically expanding it because they have a big family, but they're supposed to be, you know, not that well off, which I think they kind of tried to portray in this, but I did notice like in this movie, and I think it's probably like the director or the cinematographer compared to the other movies, like you do see more of the like scene architecture you see more like castle fly throughs and stuff like that, that you don't really get in the later movies because they're focused more on the characters. So I was kind of like noticing like, oh, the architecture of Hogwarts is pretty cool. And like, maybe that's why I'm noticing the borough as looking different or something. Cause I feel like there are more like scenes filmed farther back. So you like get more of the scenery in, in the, this movie compared to the later movies anyway. Yeah, no, I think so. I think there's a lot of sweeping shots going on and you really try to get the true ambiance of the wizarding world and the scenery around it. Yeah, more so than the characters in a way, I feel like, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. compared to the later movies anyway. Uh, Because there's mm -hmm. definitely like a difference between movie one and two and the movie three through. How old are the actors? Age-wise, they're supposed to be... 12 slash 13 for her mind. How old were they in real life? So I have perspective. I think they were that age, okay. like 12 or 13. Well, can we talk about the awkward stare down between Ron's little sister and Harry when they yep. see each other? Oh, it's great. Scene? I love it. I <laughs> She's love only it. like 11. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She has a big crush on Harry, which is the point of the shocked face. Yeah. She's supposed to have a huge crush on her. Is it mutual at this point? No. At that point, it's just Ginny for Harry. So no love interest at this point for Harry. No, not, not for at anyone. this point for anyone. Okay. No, he's okay. only 12. Well, it was a, it was a weird stare by yeah. by mini redhead. Doesn't know how to react to him because he's a celebrity. Okay, all right, and because he's so dreamy. Yeah, you get more than the first book because it's like everybody is like he's a celebrity and he's here, and then everybody who's known him for a year gets used to it, and then Ginny isn't because she's a year younger, so she hasn't like met him yet. Okay, in like a real way, so she's oh no, still, she played it real cool. She's still <laughs> kind of starstruck. Yeah. <laughs> He ends up marrying her, so. Well, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. (laughs) Something that I noticed, they're in the borough and then they end up leaving so that they can go to Diagon Alley and get school supplies for the year. And before they do the flu powder situation, they're all wearing Weasley sweaters, but it's August. I know. (laughs) They're dressed for the winter and it is August. I have like some serious problems about this part so i can't wait to talk about it (laughs) right before we get into it there's one thing i do want to say is that in the book they leave out this whole big thing where harry gets in trouble by the ministry for using magic underage even though it's dobby who did it yes i remember that he gets blamed for dobby's magic because you use magic outside of hogwarts until you're of age Mm -hmm. which is 17 so (laughs) dobby using magic harry gets blamed for it and he gets in trouble with the government i totally forgot about that and they like are like if you do this one more time you're expelled and he like has a breakdown he's like it fucking wasn't me (laughs) and they're like we don't care (laughs) the whole reason that mrs mason the fancy lady that was over left is not because of the pudding cake flying in the air it doesn't land on her in the books but still it floats and crashes what made her leave is that she's afraid of birds so when an owl flies into the house she freaks out and they have to leave oh yeah the owl flies in to deliver the note to say like the ministry caught you using magic well you know what the movie got a 
it better than the books there. Yeah. Because that sounds absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> the pie over the face is a way better reason than leave than <laughs> spotting a beautiful white owl just, you know, flying around. I gotta get out of well, here. Well, flies into the house and drops uh, the letter. Like- I mean, I'd be impressed. Same. That'd be <laughs> yeah. super sweet. Yeah. So, yes, back to the flu powder scene is they are going to Nocturne Alley and they definitely change... Oh, right. So, yes, they're trying to go to Diagon Alley, and then Harry Or Diagon is, Alley, as Harry says. Well, something. Harry just says, like, di- at least according to the closed captioning, because I had it on while I was watching, Harry just says diagonally the direction, which makes me very confused about when I told on this podcast, yeah, the reason it's called Diagon Alley is a pun for diagonally. A lot of people said, whoa, I never knew that before. And literally in the movie, they point that out, which I found confusing that more people didn't get that that's what Diagon Alley is. I didn't pick up on that, but I feel you now. No, you've mm-hmm. lost me altogether. Like <laughs> diagonally, Diagon Alley. Mm. Yeah. Gotcha. I see it. It's a pun, but not an exciting one. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not all that great. The cool one, though, is where Harry ends up by accident. He ends up at Nocturne Alley, like nocturnally, yeah, and it's the dark, yeah. creepy one. So that pun is actually cool. The diagonally one is... Stretch. Yeah, your reaction is just, I see what you did there. I'm not impressed by it, (laughs) but I I literally see what you did. (laughs) So in the books, doesn't he end up in the basement, not like in the middle of a fucking store? I think he ends up in a store. I'm not exactly sure if the location is different, but I do know that in the books, it is far more drawn out. He overhears Lucius and Draco Malfoy doing business in Borgen and Burks, and it takes a whole lot longer. Yeah, and I thought he was in the basement, though. Like, he has to, like, crawl up and sneak out. Like, in the movie, he, like, lands in the store, and there's just no one in there. He doesn't have to, like, crawl out of anything. He's just like, where the fuck am I? There's weird shit in here. And then he goes out and literally everyone is wearing black because they're quote unquote evil. (laughs) Everyone has to be creepy. They're in the creepy part of Diagon Alley. (laughs) Yeah. And also it's like literally steps away from the Mm -hmm. quote unquote safety of Diagon Alley. But like everyone in Nocturne Alley is a fucking creep. Well, what was Hagrid doing there then? He was getting flesh eating slug repellent. Or at least that's what he said he was getting. Hagrid is a questionable character. Wow. Hagrid collects illegal creatures <laughs> and is half giant, so he's not like afraid of being in Nocturnally because nobody can really beat him up, if mm. you will. Okay. <laughs> but it is like well. a wall away from the safe part of town, and it is like severely unsafe. I would like to know, like, what were all those creepos about to do before Hagrid came in and saved the day? Like, yeah. what were they going to do? How? Like, he didn't have any money on him. <laughs> yeah, no. Was he anything? They're going to eat him. What, yeah, they were going to eat him? Oh, they, I don't know. Yeah, they made Nocturnelli <laughs> sound so bad. Like, who would even walk down that street? And it's just like, is it really that bad? I don't know. I doubt it. Yeah, it is strange to think what they were going to try to do with Harry. One thing that I did find very funny when Harry does end up in the shop is there's one of those creepy hands there and he grabs the thumb like what did you expect was going to happen Harry of course it's, <laughs> of course gonna, it's gonna, grab gonna grab you, you. <laughs> <laughs> rookie mistake no but yes Harry eventually gets out of Nocturne Alley because it steps away from Diagon Alley <laughs> like it's not that hard to leave you're just like oh I just have to walk that way and turn a corner and I'm safe again oh okay cool I'll do that then so Hagrid gets him the <laughs> safe protection and then he runs into all the other Weasleys Hermione's there one thing that I did notice from movie two to movie one is that Daniel Radcliffe's hair as Harry gets way better and Hermione Emma Watson's hair gets way worse well, her, yeah, her hair yeah. gets way better in the next movie, though. Yeah, it was just a weird, awkward. She's got bangs and then they're very straight and then it's really wavy and stuff at the bottom. And I don't know if they were actively going for her having bushy hair because that's what she's described in the book. The problem, and I don't know if this is because Emma Watson's hair isn't like this or the wig department or whatever they were doing is it looked like she styled it intentionally that way and not like she had messy hair. So it just made it look like she was going for a look that didn't work for her. (laughs) Yeah, I think they like made her sleep in braids but it's Uh, actually supposed to be like 
curly and frizzy, uh-huh. right. but her hair's not. So mm-hmm. they like tried to make it wavy and you're just like, people don't have hair like that. Yeah, it had Kramer from Seinfeld vibes and it just wasn't good. <laughs> her hair, I think, is supposed to like drastically improve after the fourth year. But like because the directors change, I think technically next movie it gets way better okay. and like more curly. Like it's supposed yep. to I think it's supposed to be curly and yes. frizzy, curly, bushy, frizzy. Yeah. And they totally were just like, well, let's just have her sleep in braids and see what happens. Let's make her a crimp and curl pony. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're like 80s crimp. Yes, that's what it should be. (laughs) So eventually they make their way to Flourish and Blots, the bookstore, and they meet Gilderoy Lockhart. And I just got to say, the dude playing Lockhart is incredible. He is so good. Easily the most redeeming part of the film. Is this yes. Professor Fabio? Yeah, Professor <laughs> yeah. Fabio. Oh, oh yeah. First. <laughs> yeah, I did like him. He was probably my favorite part of this movie, too. He's so funny. Before they walk into the shop, though, why is Hermione allowed to use magic, but no one else? So that is a whole thing because they leave out that scene where Harry is supposed to be getting in trouble for doing magic. Yeah. And they don't even address that. It changes all this other stuff, especially because in the first movie, Hermione fixes Harry's glasses on the train, which again is technically not allowed because they're not at school yet, but she doesn't get in trouble for that. Yeah, but they're older kids on the train. Yeah. So it can be like linked to them. Or like, I guess she could, that could be linked to anyone in Diagon Alley. So I guess that's why she does it. But like the rest of them don't even try to use magic. And she's just like, Fuck you guys. Yeah, it's it was a whole thing that, that that was a whole article that I read was one of the biggest inconsistencies is just where they're allowed to do magic where they aren't because they leave it out of the first and yeah. the second. It's this whole big ordeal. Also, why are they all wearing their school robes to go shopping? Is That's that weird? That's also so strange. I don't understand. Okay. <laughs> they're just like, let's wear our school uniforms to go shopping. Like, why? Why are we all wearing our school robes right does, now? Yeah, it doesn't really make any sense. I don't think they do that in the later movies, but anyway. I don't think so. They pretty much ditch the robes all together with. Yeah. And it's not like you could tell they were still wearing normal clothes. They were just like wearing their school coats like weirdos. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it's still August and they're dressed. They must have filmed this movie in February or something. (laughs) Maybe. I don't know. Because they're all wearing coats all the time and you're just like, it's August. (laughs) What are you doing with your life? Also, I've noticed they actually you can't really tell till maybe like halfway through the movie, But in the right lighting, you can tell that they actually made Ron's robes like grayer. Like they made his robes look secondhand. I was really really intrigued by that. Yeah. I like that they did that. Yeah. There was a lot of attention to detail in that. His robes like legit were not as black as Hermione's and uh, Harry's, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned the robes looking dingier because it actually is a point of discussion for the next characters that we get to meet. We meet Lucius Malfoy as well as Draco Malfoy. Draco's hair has also gotten worse. Yeah. (laughs) Did you also notice that all of the Weasleys and Harry have soot all over their faces from traveling through flu powder, which like that doesn't happen. No. And if it does, like, isn't it an easy, clean charm? Like, people yes, f- travel by flu be. all the time yep. and don't end up covered in soot. The entire scene, all of the Weasleys and Harry are covered in soot. And it bothered <laughs> me so much. I was like, A, clean yourselves. B, that doesn't happen. C, you're not the only people to travel by flu powder. Like, that bothered me beyond belief. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) But they change a little bit of this interaction in the book. There's a little more of a back and forth between Lucius and Arthur, where Lucius is being really rude and Arthur shows how good and stand up of a person that he is. Whereas in the film, their interaction is just a very dismissive thing where Lucius eventually says to Arthur, see you at work and in a very dismissive way. They are rude towards Ron even Lucius Malfoy. But one thing that is very interesting about Lucius's interaction with Harry here is he says, excuse me, and then kind of grabs Harry. And then when he (laughs) notices that he's Harry Potter, looks at the scar and then starts to compliment Voldemort. You know, the person that murdered Harry's parents. It is (laughs) just a buck wild interaction for two humans to have. Is that happening? the books too i'm not exactly sure but just watching it i just realized how wild of 
a thing that is for Lucius Malfoy to do is to compliment the murderer of an orphan's parents in front of him. Yeah, I guess. But like, you have to think like Lucius at this point is like almost his second in command. Like it's like Bellatrix and Lucius are like Voldemort's one, two punch at this point, because they're the only two people that have two of his Horcruxes. Mm -hmm. And like, after Lucius does this little shindig with the Horcrux, he gets severely demoted. Also, when he, like, screws up the ministry thing in the fifth book, obviously he gets pretty low on the rung of Death Eaters. But at this point, he's supposed to be pretty high up there. Right. And obviously has, like, a hero worship toward Voldemort. Mm -hmm. I'm with you, though, Mike. It was, (laughs) at one point he's saying, excuse me, and then the next point he's praising the murderer of your parents. Yeah. <laughs> like, just polar opposites. Well, uh, purebloods are known for being, like, super polite in, like, an old world manners sense. Which is why it, he would say, excuse me. Yeah, the guy's <laughs> certified asshole. Oh, definitely a certified <laughs> asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what I do have to say about Lucius thing is obviously Lucius is a horrible, terrible person. But again, the dude playing Lucius is so good. Yes. He's just the perfect level of evil and you hate him and he's just so fancy and proper. And ugh. I fucking love Lucius as a character, though. Why? He sucks. But he doesn't. He's like so awesomely bad. You were rooting for that guy? No, I'm not rooting for that guy. But he's like a good... I don't know. It's like Umbridge. He's a well-written villain. He's okay. a very well-written okay. villain. Well, yeah. But you don't like him. Right. But I do now. <laughs> like, as the character, not as, like, yes. you support his decisions. No, I don't support his decisions, <laughs> but I like his character. <laughs> After I've read all the books, I just like Slytherins now. I don't know. I think they're, like, well-written. Well, uh, this podcast has been great. Travis, now it's just me and you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Be gone. There's, like, a lot more i don't know there's a lot more depth to them than we get in the books they don't like focus on them you just read a bunch of fan fiction written by slytherins that feel bad that their house is the bad guys in the books so they have to make up for it by (laughs) which is fine like (laughs) in the books they are written as the bad guys so they got to make up for it by making complex stories it's so obvious every scene if they're in the grand hall whatever you call it and they're eating their food everyone's clapping and those sons of bitches are (laughs) I know, I know, I know. Just like evil eyes. Like, you like them? No, they don't get (laughs) enough character development. They don't. They don't get the facets of their life written. They just get like the (laughs) evil part. Well, you know what? Clap once in a while. Smile. I don't know. (laughs) Oh, I know. (laughs) I just think like another perspective from their point of view, would be fun to read. Oh, yes, 100%, 100%. But that's not what we get in the bags. No. Oh, geez, this is a whole lot to unpack here. My sister is using fan fiction to justify the actions of horrible people in the series. Hey, it's me editing, Mike, how's it going? I know past Mike had to come to grips with this, so let's all take a break here and just process what my sister is trying to say with a little bit of Wingardium at Ridosa. Today's episode of Potterless is brought to you by DoorDash. Let's say hypothetically that you are an incredibly charming wizard that just got a new job at a prestigious wizarding school, and you're really busy preparing your lessons where you don't do anything, but you still have to care for your adoring fans and sign all of their autographs. And you can't put people in detention all of the time, so sometimes you have to pull late nights attending to your adoring fans. You can't really take breaks to eat dinner. What are you going to do to make sure that you have fuel to sign all of these autographs? You're going to order in some food with DoorDash. DoorDash connects you to your favorite restaurants in your city or wizarding village. They have over 340,000 restaurants in over 3,300 cities in the U.S. and Canada, so you can order from a place that you already know is a favorite or find something new. With DoorDash, I've placed orders from classic chains to late-night pizza spots here in New York to Asian fusion cuisine places that I really wanted to try. There's so many different options, and it's nice to not have to worry about dinner, but just to let dinner come to you with DoorDash. And if this sounds interesting, you're in luck, because as a Potterless listener, you can get $5 off your first order of $15 or more when you 
download the DoorDash app and enter promo code Potterless at checkout. Again, you'll save $5 on your first order, as long as it's $15 or more, when you download the DoorDash app and use the promo code Potterless. So download the app, use the promo code Potterless, save $5 on an order of $15 or more, and make sure that you're able to sign all the autographs and thank people for complimenting you on your fifth win of which weekly's most charming smile today. Today's episode of Potterless is also brought to you by Calm. Let's say hypothetically that you are writing in your diary and it's writing back in creepy manners and possessing you every now and then, and really it's just a huge time suck. And you're spending a lot of time with this diary and you really want to make sure that you're getting good sleep because they have you up all at weird hours, roaming the halls when you're not really paying attention to it. How are you going to make the most of your sleep when you actually get the chance to sleep? You're going to use the app Calm. Calm is the number one app for sleep and it can help you fight against sleep deficiency, which does serious damage, not only to your brain, but to your body. When you're sleep deprived, you're more prone to accidents and tripping, and that's bad for me, an already incredibly clumsy person. But Calm is here to help with their library of programs. You can fall asleep quickly and sleep soundly, whether it's their sleep stories or soundscapes or guided meditations with rain noises in the background. Calm can help you go to bed right away and sleep through the night with a smile on your face, I can only assume. (laughs) I'm the kind of person where I can't fall asleep until my brain kind of knows that it's time to fall asleep, so putting on something from Calm can help kick me into gear to say, hey buddy, let's get some rest. It's three in the morning, you should probably sleep. So I appreciate Calm a whole lot. So if you wanna seize the day, Sleep at night with the help of Calm. And right now, as a Potterless listener, you can get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash Potterless. That's C-A-L-M dot com slash Potterless. You'll get 25% off a Calm premium subscription and get access to all of their audio programs. 40 million people have downloaded Calm, so find out why and make sure that you are sleeping through the night after you're up at strange hours because of this possessed diary at calm.com slash Potterless. Today's episode of Powderless is also brought to you by HelloFresh. Let's say hypothetically that you are a mother of seven and your rambunctious children just came back from a late night escapade with a flying car and you need to prepare food for your entire family, but you don't have time to go to the grocery store and all this other stuff. How are you going to make that happen? You're going to use HelloFresh. HelloFresh makes sure that you have everything you need in order to make an incredible dinner in just about 30 minutes from their step-to-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients. You can break out of your dinner rut with over 17 seasonal chef-curated recipes each week. They have family recipes, calorie smart recipes, vegetarian recipes, hall of fame recipes, craft burger recipes, so many options to choose from. And HelloFresh realizes that as the mother of a bunch of wizards, your life is constantly in flux, so you can change your delivery days, your food preferences, skip a week whenever you need. Recently, I made some cherry balsamic pork chops for my HelloFresh box. It was incredible. My buddy Adam and I were going to go to a Yankee game. Food is very expensive there, so we decided we were going to cook food and eat it right before leaving for the game. He brought over some beer. I made the dinner. It only took 25 minutes. We ate it up, went to the game, didn't have to purchase any expensive overpriced food at the game, and it was a fantastic experience, and it was really tasty. So if that sounds up your alley, you are in luck, because as a Potterless listener, you can get $80 off your first month of HelloFresh if you go to HelloFresh.com slash Potterless80 and enter the code Potterless80. That gets you $20 off your first four boxes, which that's great. You're saving a bunch of money if you go to HelloFresh.com slash Potterless80 and enter code Potterless80. So Again, HelloFresh.com slash Potterless80. Enter the promo code Potterless80. Get that food delivered directly to your door so that you can quickly prepare meals for your wizarding children and their friend Harry that just happened to show up today. Something else in this scene that was really strange to me is that Hermione's parents are there. And they're not the same people that they are in the last book. In the books, do her parents go? I think so, because she's only 12. I think they do. I think I do think that's true. They just let muggle parents go into Diagon Alley? I think so. What about the whole statute of secrecy? Well, I think that goes null and void like when you have a witch or wizard. Oh, right. That makes either sense. married to okay. you or like they're born, okay, you know, okay, they're okay. your child. Child. But yeah, that's why I don't I don't understand how that's the statue of secrecy is still a thing. I think that's only because the wizarding population is so small, I guess. But yeah, it's supposed to be like it, you're not supposed to know about it until you're either married to one or if one of your children is one. Okay. But then, you know, you're not supposed to tell anybody else. So I think Diagon Alley they can go to, but like they can't go to Hogwarts because and maybe I'm making this up, but I think it's got something on it where it, like, it looks like ruins to muggles. It doesn't yes, look it like does. a castle. It's supposed to look like a dilapidated castle with like a keep out sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that it must not have any kind of like 
anti-muggle wards on it like Hogwarts does. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, she's only 12. What's right. she going to do? Just like go by herself? <laughs> I think after book three or maybe it's book four, you know, when she starts going to um, Grimald Place or whatever, or the order starts becoming a thing, I think mm-hmm. she just goes with the Weasleys and stays with the Weasleys. But I think right now, yeah, they just meet up with the Weasleys. You never really know in this book because Harry can't really correspond with them and you really only get his point of view. But I think behind the scenes, like, Hermione's still at this point living with her parents in the summer and stuff. I don't think she's, like, fully integrated into the magical world until the Order of the Phoenix becomes a thing. Yeah, that makes sense. So a couple other things that they change in this part of the book before they end up heading back to Hogwarts by using the car is first, there's the iconic scene where Arthur Weasley in the film asks Harry when you learn that Arthur is obsessed with muggle stuff and that's his job at the ministry. In the film, he asks Harry, like, tell me, Harry, what is the purpose of rubber ducks? Yeah. (laughs) Which I think is a big improvement actually in the books because in the books he asks about escalators, which isn't that complex. It's like, yeah, dude, there's stairs (laughs) that move move. (laughs) so that you don't have to walk or you can walk faster. Asking about rubber ducks, I think is a huge improvement because that would be something like, why are they in every bathtub? I don't understand this. (laughs) Why do you enjoy this? They don't really serve a purpose. (laughs) (laughs) Also, one of the scenes we do get the Ginny shocked face thing, but also we get another thing that has been turned into a memes. There's a lot of things that are used as meme gifts now or endearing gifts are from this movie i didn't realize how many came from this but you get the ron crying while driving the car when they have to make their way back to hogwarts which there's a really great meme where it's like the people from fast and the furious like vin diesel staring down the (laughs) opponent car and then they photoshop it where it's ron behind the ford anglia it's a really classic one ron is such a bitch in this movie oh my god when they get in that car it's like why isn't harry wearing a (sighs) seatbelt like he doesn't almost fall out of the car in the book does he? No. So yeah, it's a whole thing that changes. So in the book, when they eventually get in the car and and head back to Hogwarts because Dobby changes the platform nine and three quarters thing so they can't go back on the Hogwarts Express, in the book, they get all the way to Hogwarts pretty scot-free and then the whole Whomping Willow thing happens. In the movie, and this is a theme where they drag out some things to just make them more intense because they feel like they need to, the car almost gets hit by the Hogwarts Express and then Harry almost falls out of it and he's dangling by his arm. And then they're flipping under the bridge, Uh around the train. There's just so much going on and then they get all the way to Hogwarts and then they get beat up by the tree. So it's just, they've added so much to what was a very quick scene in the book. Also, Ron breaking his wand. Mm -hmm. This is your second year of Hogwarts. Clearly yelling stop, stop, stop is not a spell. (laughs) Like, you should know that by now. (laughs) My goodness. So then, yes, they eventually get to... Hogwarts and they get beat by the Whomping Willow. Again, it's a really long scene in the film. Get out of the freaking car, you kids. <laughs> They're just sitting there. I mean, clearly, even the car knows the first chance he gets. He's like, I'm out. <laughs> like, He's fuck you guys. He's out of there. Like, get out of the freaking car. The tree is trying to eat you. In the books, they are much more competent about dealing with this situation. And I think it's less dragged out because, yeah, they are in the car for a very long time in the movie, which (laughs) is very silly because they keep getting attacked by the tree. But I don't know. I guess they got the tree special effects, so they really had to make the most of them. a little bit longer. (laughs) Another thing that this made me think about is the car just is able to fly all the way into Hogwarts and then get beat by the tree. Are there no protective charms that would stop this? You can't apparate into Hogwarts, but you can just fly the car in? It seems very strange just looking back. I think a million percent there would have been things preventing that from happening, but... (laughs) I mean, as Snape points out later on, they were spotted five times. (laughs) And you know how Dumbledore is like partially clairvoyant. Like maybe he knew it was happening and put down some wards or whatever. (laughs) And just let them get beat up by the tree. It was fine. Yeah. (laughs) He's like, well, I can only help them so much. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so yeah, the Snape thing actually changes it because in the book they get caught by Snape and not Filch. Yeah. And then there's the whole scene where they miss the opening ceremony and then McGonagall comes in and then they eat sandwiches and all of that and you lose all of that, which is fine. But they handle the scene a little bit differently in the film where the, the teachers come in. Oh, well, Snape's about to like almost expel them and then Dumbledore right. comes in and he's like, not so fast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Snape's like... Damn it. Foiled again. <laughs> Dumbledore. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, the, yeah, the core in the film is like, oh, you're going to expel us. And it's not today, Weasley. <laughs> <laughs> they look at each other all shocked. <laughs> oh, please. Oh, all right. But yes, then eventually we get into some Hogwarts scenes where they're going to classes and we have the herbology class where they're dealing with the mandrakes. First of all, the greenhouses are like, they look awesome. They do look very cool. And Sprout's outfit is like the most on point. Very cool cinematography when they yeah fly when they fly through the, the top yeah the greenhouses. The this is a cool. great scene. Yeah, totally. mm-hmm. The mandrakes are scary as fuck. They're terrifying as they should be. And they're like little babies that I don't know how someone actually chops them up to make potions out of them. Yeah, they look like like, infants. I would feel like I was killing a baby. (laughs) Like a really ugly, screaming baby, but like still a baby and Mm -hmm. not just a root, you know? Yep, yep, yep. Definitely strange. (laughs) Never want to deal with them. Are you a plant? Are you an animal? What are you? It's a magical plant, I guess. But yeah, it's low-key terrifying. It's like Venus flytrap in like a... I know you're a plant, but you're also, like, kind of not a plant. Feed me, Neville Longbottom. (laughs) (laughs) But speaking of Neville, at one point when they're doing the Mandrake things, he faints, and then Sprout just doesn't do anything. (laughs) (laughs) He'll be fine. (laughs) A student just passed out in your class, Sprout. I think you should make sure he's okay or call Pomfrey or whatever. She just goes, "Ah, he'll be fine. What? You have a nurse. (laughs) Send him to the healer. <laughs> also, a minor thing that they do change is that this classroom includes students from Slytherin. And in the books, specifically, it's just supposed to be Hufflepuff and Gryffindor. But I understand why they did it. You get all the faces you recognize in the mix. All four houses are in every class in the movie. I think they do that in every movie, to be honest. Yeah, I think it's so you can see familiar faces. And yeah. You can pay the actors that have more face time, like get Malfoy in more scenes and stuff like that. In the books, it's like every class, it's two houses. Yeah. So you're not always in class with the Slytherins or whatever. Gotcha. They're like, yeah, they, they rotate. Yeah. So another thing that I just found interesting, and I don't think they said this in the books, but Ron fixes his wand with scotch tape. Oh my God, this is... <laughs> I was like, where did Ron get tape? Do wizards use tape? <laughs> it seems like tape is something that would not exist at Hogwarts. There no, has to be spells that do anything tape? that tape would do. They don't even use pens. They use quills and <laughs> right. ink. There's no fucking way they have so, scotch tape. <laughs> I'm glad you brought this up. So, like, this is a, looks like a world-class institution. Yes. Every world-class college university has, I don't know, a bookstore, like, whenever you walk in to, mm-hmm. hey, hey, I broke my wand. Here's a replacement. We're going to charge you an arm and a leg for it, but here's a replacement. No, you have to go to a special wand maker. I mean, come on. No, wands Where's are it? very special in the world, yeah. Some convenience there. But that does seem weird that you wouldn't have, like, some sort of wand repair person at the school. You're a bunch of kids doing magic for the first time. They can't fix them. Like, creating wands is, like, an art form that only several people know. So you have to go to a special wand shop because it's like a magical core and then magical wood. In the school. No, it's only in that place where they bought books. Like they could easily go there with a teacher if they broke their wand. But Ron is too poor to be able to afford another one because they're expensive. You're really I mean, only supposed to school, buy. Maybe have like a handful in storage, like right <laughs> next to where the janitor, wand. you know. Yeah, you can't here. like use. This will get you by. But you can't use just any wand. It doesn't cooperate with your magic. That's like a big thing. All right. Although I don't understand how it worked for him for the whole fucking year. He has this broken wand. Like clearly JK wrote it so that Gilderoy gets confounded by the wand or whatever at the end mm-hmm. of the book. But like, there's no way Ron could have passed his classes with that That's wand. That's true. 
Yeah, that's wild. It backfires every spell. And yet he continued to use spells. Yeah, that's what we're like, saying. Like, it doesn't make any sense that he could yeah. continue his education with the wand he had, mm -hmm. but she needed it to be broken for like the end scene. Sure. It's not even that it doesn't work. It's that it actively backfires or does the opposite of what he's trying to do. Yeah. It'd be like if you were trying to take notes in class, but then instead of you writing in the book, it just like threw letters all over the wall. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you would not be able to survive a week. No. There's no way that he could make it through the whole school year. But yeah, I guess it is a convenient plot point thing. Wouldn't yeah, she, exactly. Wouldn't she use like good spells to like project on yourself? <laughs> like flip the script and yeah. all of a sudden like give yourself some type of superpower? And honestly, he's not that... Come on, Ron. He's not like a great wizard to begin with. So like already he's already having trouble like learning these spells and then on top of it his wand is a pos yeah but that is an interesting strategy travis i like that suggestion is if it keeps doing the opposite maybe that's how ron got through the whole year is he just kept saying the opposite of what he would want to happen <laughs> exactly i mean what an opportunity he's in transfiguration <laughs> class and you're supposed to turn a rat into a water goblet and then he just says ah i'm going to say water goblet into a rat and then it does the opposite Opposite and boom, <laughs> I've cracked the case of my broken wand. Well, it doesn't actually do the opposite. It like my backfires man. on yourself. Right. Yeah, yeah. So we'd have to say he wants to turn himself into yes. a water <laughs> goblet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then uh, boom, it makes it work. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so Gilderoy Lockhart has an order of Merlin? Yeah. I should go back and see if this is actually the exact introduction that he gives in the book. But I do love in the film that his opening line is he comes into the classroom and he goes, let me introduce you to your new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor. And then he waits a beat. <laughs> a perfect <laughs> amount. And then goes, me. <laughs> oh, it was so good. This actor is incredible. Yeah. He's so funny. <laughs> oh. Travis was like, why would they hire that guy? I'm like, oh, you don't get it. <laughs> it's, a whole, uh, it's a whole thing. It makes no sense, but it does make sense. And blah, blah, blah. Oh, my God. It was so funny. I read a fan fiction where they were like talking about why he got hired, and it was because Dumbledore had a huge crush on him. That's and a I very was like, fun oh fan my god, theory. that is so believable. It's <laughs> a pretty fun theory. Are we to the point where he yeah. lets out the blue? Yes, trolls that, oh, that's yeah, what's yes. about to go down because they change the scene a whole lot. In the movie, he kind of starts the class and this is the very first thing he does and then the pixies start terrorizing the class and then he immediately pieces out and that's not how it went down. Also, the kids don't do it. It, it was just this whole thing. They changed a lot of things here. Yeah, because literally no one uses magic for like 20 minutes and then Hermione's like magic and they mm -hmm. all stop. And you're just like, wait, why were you trying to like smack them off of each other with a book? Why didn't anyone think to use magic until now? <laughs> I don't understand. Well, dude's such a poser. Like we, of course, learn later. Right. Yeah. He, he's a poser, but he still has the guts to just open up this cage and just run away like what an asshole. He is What's an this asshole. guy doing? Thank God for Hermione saving the day there. Yeah, I'm not sure if in the books it was as intentional as they made it in the movies. It felt very malicious in the film. I don't think in the book he's like, open a cage and let them all just run free. I think like something happens where they get out of hand and then he can't control it. But I don't think it starts off as much chaos as it does in the movie. No, okay. and the way that they actually solve it in the book is more of a gradual solution to the problem. So Hermione does a couple spells to get some of them individually back into the cage and then also in the movie the kids just run out of the room but in the books everybody hides under their desks while the main squad tries to get rid of them individually so I guess for the purposes of the film they just made it a lot more hectic and quick but I think it was a bit more creative in its execution and more thoughtful in the book itself yeah because it takes like the whole class period in the right book, it's, it's the whole thing and Lockhart in the book actually hides under his desk but in the movie he just kind of leaves um they do keep the neville chandelier thing which is great but in the book he falls off the chandelier and almost hits lockhart and i was surprised that they wouldn't include that since they added a whole thing where vernon falls out of a window you would think people falling for a comedic effect would be a theme but yeah, i guess they just decided neville. to get rid of that one <laughs> i feel like they change a lot of things 
And this is the same thing with just getting to the Whomping Willow. I feel like they decided for whatever reason that the book didn't make things wild enough so they had to really amp it up and try to make it so hectic but i think it loses a bit of the creativity in the way which it was writing just to be like oh there's a lot going on here yeah it's way like overly dramatic in Mm -hmm. like an unbelievable way like when you're watching it it's just you're just like why is no one thinking of magic and then all of a sudden hermione does one spell and they all stop like that doesn't make sense Mm -hmm. even lockhart's non-spell like come on all spells are in Latin. <laughs> Saying pesky pixies or whatever the fuck he says, you're just like, you already know that that's not a real spell because they're all in fucking Latin, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a great look for Gilderoy, but no. that's his whole thing. But one final thing that I, I want to say about Neville that I noticed in this scene is I just the actor that played him, his puberty is so astonishing. Yeah, it, it is. is truly, <laughs> it is truly incredible because in the first movie, you look at Neville and okay, he's kind of pudgy and his teeth aren't great, but he's 10 or 11 years old. He doesn't really, he, he doesn't look that bad, but in this movie, he, because it, it's, I mean, all the kids are going through puberty because they're actually the ages. Yeah. Neville looks significantly worse in this one, but man, the way that Neville ends up, I mean, we've, I am no stranger to talk about how attractive that actor has become, but the zero to 100 that he did is truly a work of art. I don't think Travis would believe it. This, no, I think I know. This was the buck tooth yes. looking kid. Yeah. yeah, no, I do know at the end. He, He's I even know, Yeah. Well, well, I wouldn't have said that. Well, I know. <laughs> Take it <laughs> but easy <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. He's not like exactly my type, but. <laughs> Becomes very, very good looking man. Yeah, he does. <laughs> But yeah, Matthew Lewis, congratulations. I believe you have the greatest puberty to ever live. So shout out to you, man. Very proud of you. I'm sure you worked very hard at it. (laughs) And it was very intentional because that's how puberty for sure works. But Megan Trev, we're gonna we're gonna put a pause here for this first discussion of the film. I love that we've been talking for over an hour and (laughs) they've they've gone to two classes. So clearly we're just doing a great job of staying on track. But I love it. Tangents are what make the show. It's their fault. They dragged out the car scene. (laughs) Yes. Much like this film (laughs) dragging out (laughs) scenes, we are dragging out the discussion of this movie. But thank you both so much for for joining on. We'll be talking over the rest of the films and maybe this will even become a three-part episode if we keep this pace up. But who's going to complain about more Potter? The movie's not that good. (laughs) I think that's the problem is that we have so many issues with the film that we're talking a lot about it. Yes, I agree. We're just like, and this part is also wrong. Wrong and bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my notes for I have a separate note section of just things that were different, and compared to the one for the first, that's like four times as long. Yeah, <laughs> they just really decided to change all a lot of here. But thank you all so much for joining. Usually, this is the part where people plug stuff, but you guys are are just family. We're just of regular me. people. <laughs> Now, shout out to Aurora <laughs> Fruhoff. Yeah, we'll, no, we'll shout out to Aurora Fruhoff, producer level for patron. For being awesome. Yeah. <laughs> She's sleeping. I guess she already has a job at age two and a half so that she can support the podcast. Truly astonishing that she's able to do so. But no, she's quite adorable. I can't wait to see her at Thanksgiving. That's going to be fantastic. I miss her. She misses you too. I'm glad that she fully understands her responsibilities as flower girl in the wedding. Barbara, (laughs) our mother, told me that she's been talking about it. Yeah, she asked me, she was talking about wearing a white dress and she goes, just like Aunt Kelly. And I was like, and you're going to wear a white dress for their wedding too. And she goes, can I wear my bell dress? And I was like, I was like, I don't think so. And she was like, how about a pretty pink dress? And I go, well, we have to ask Aunt Kelly. (laughs) She goes, okay. So now every time we talk about it, she goes, and I wear a pretty pink dress, ask Aunt Kelly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, one of the wedding colors will be pink so that actually I know could be I was like play. okay so maybe but we have to ask Aunt Kelly I think Kelly will prefer her to wear a pink one because classic Kelly can be the only one wearing white thing. I'm in favor of it, but much like Aurora, I'll have to ask Aunt Kelly. Yeah, but I, I do not think wearing her bell costume 
would be appropriate. I think Belle is Kelly's favorite Disney princess because she's a big old nerd. So, <laughs> so maybe it'll happen. Bro. How about this? She wear she can wear a pretty pink dress for the ceremony, and then when Kelly does the thing, what's the term for when you get the dress like hiked up in the back? Uh, when the bustle. Yeah, when when Kelly bustled. bustles her dress, Aurora can costume change into. <laughs> her bell dress <laughs> or the mermaid one with the song thing since last time we were together and this was one of the funniest oh, things man, I've ever this witnessed. Is so dramatic. <laughs> what a perfect one in the episode. So we were in Dallas. Aurora is taking a nap. And just before Kelly and I have to catch our flight home, she wakes up from the nap and she's very excited to show us that she has this aerial dress, which has the little shell that when you push the button, it plays the ah uh, uh, song. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yes. she pushes it and it doesn't work. And she just looks at you with this despair in her eyes. Oh, and my then gosh. you realize the batteries are dead and then just explosion of tears. <laughs> Full meltdown. And it needs a watch battery, so it's not like we have those on hand to replace. Not at all. Full on meltdown. Why doesn't my dress sing anymore? And you're just like, it's a dress. <laughs> and, then, and then we had to go to the airport, so that was the last memory we have of Aurora <laughs> before I see her in like two months. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy good. to report she's forgotten about it, I think. <laughs> no, no, she has not no. forgotten. No, no, no. But that will live with well, her. She for hasn't the rest picked. Of her life. She's gotten over she, she, it. I she guess she hasn't picked out that dress again. No, she hasn't. <laughs> we wore Tiana's dress We're today. Still, that's good. That's very good. Yeah. Oh man. Well, Megan Trapp, thanks so much for joining. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. And as they say in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, before they push the button to make their mermaid dresses sing, <laughs> wizard on. <laughs> If you enjoyed this episode because I dunked on this movie more than I did the first, you should check out the Maturity Corner bonus episodes on the Patreon. Johnny and I just put on the movies and talk over them and then upload them, so it's like a comedic director's commentary roof tracks of sorts. It's a good time if you go to patreon.com slash Potterless and go to bonus episodes, it'll be there. Potterless is created by Mick Schubert, it is hosted by Mick Schubert, it is edited by Mick Schubert, it is produced by Mick Schubert as well as Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Kluber, Char Klaus, Sir Lopu, Frank Chioto, Marchismo, Samantha Rose, Juan Sanfilio, Abita Med, Rose Marie Dodge, Maria Lisa C. Keen, Romina Rivadanera, Camille Doc, Russell Dunk, Audra, Eleanor Kerlin, Rossanne Batamana, Nikita Power, Taylor Armstead, Ali Madsen, Amelia Krauss, Sean Montag, Sarah Nink, Ben Silver, Rachel Guthrie, Zachary Polito, Orchid Grower, Vivian the Owl, Takaria Ront, Haley Hastings, Moster, Angelina Withred, Alex Bisholta, Brian Williams, Caitlin Sullivan, Grace Riggles, Raul Pineda, Ingen Oddstutter, Mari Wynn, Alex Consulver, John Kotker, Noel Basile, Tao, Emily Tyrell, Robin Fernandez, Will Barrington, Liz Bigelow, Mariah Noah, Brandon Pickens, Sarah Enslin, Claire Spencer, Rory Collier, Gloria Gillum, Sarah and Patrick Donovan, Alicat. 29, Veronica Bartova, Lada Bartova, Noah, Tracy Toya, Colleen, Jennifer Marklu, Frida J. Svedson, Ivor Peterson, Naomi Guglielmo, Tyler Latshaw, Summer Athel, Heather Fleischman, Vera Cullithan, Carrie D. Bagason, Andrea Crock, Elisa Grieven, Lynn Walker, Cameron Watkins, Justin Montero, Christine Saunders, Jacob Parrish, Toothless Walnut, Maya Gray, Mark Body, Polly Burge, Surjan Thanme Gupta, Neda Atabani, Sarah Shecker, Nona VM, Zina Rosnowski, Harlan Haskins, Noelia, Remy Fontaine, Addie Bryan, Jenny Campione, Nikki Harris, Cara Hamilton, Courtney Hemwood, Kine, Amanda Alfred, Sabrina, Alicia McLaren, Kafir Shaltiel, Lindy Plackey, Martha Madueno, Ben. Benjamin Desmond, Sky Mart 6, Sarah Shedder, Marta Morrison, Stephanie Magnuson, Justine Wade, Aaron Richter, CJ Ochoco, Eileen Gazesh, Violet Sullivan, Kat Yowell, Lindsay Towning, Fielding Lee, Keegan Curran, Miranda Manning, Gail Ann, Mr. Folk, Heather McMillan, Adam Bryan, Christina Welton, Maya, Zachary Davis, Kieran, Heaven, Christy, Leela Leader Williams, Wire Warrior 4976, Flor Sake, Sira Skiars for Georgia, Itzel Aime Ayala, Al Vega, Peter Wyckoff, Candy Kane, Skyla Lily, Adele Ryan, Professor Threat, Kelsey Wisen, Ellie Husk of Choba, Alubin Maleo, Akin Wande, Lena Karen, Daniel Fulkerson, Lee Lee Lee, Elizabeth Christofferson, Abby, Lee Caffaccio, Michael David Yordi, Nice Earmuffs Potter, Did Your Mom Make Them For You, Cara Hoyer, Tiffany Cottrell, Kelly Otilio, Nadia Vansgard, Andrea, Kerry Crumpler, Jamie Kingston, Camilo Garcia, Connie Bienkowski, Janet Noel Dettilli, Mary Mati, Imo Sarah, Jennifer Went, Anastasia Blake, Jaden Alman, Nedry OS, Matt Barger, Riley Lane, Will Huser, Zephyr Lawrence, Artemis Peters, Brett Clausen, Samantha Lenz, Kayla M. Simino, Lauren Wainwright, Aurora Fruhoff, Emma Clark, Hermani Snape, Lior Nachum, Megan Dick, Out of Context 69, Liam McCormick, Malena Brandy, Marco Cepeda, Ella Robertson, Hannah Zeters, Courtney, Victoria McCormick, Marie Rieger, Ashton Gabrielson, Brittany Gutierrez, Phelan, Julie Walton, The Meadows Family, Jennifer from the Block, Anna Penalver, Alvarez, Fake Valentine, Brianna Jordan, Karu Terra, Sarah Saunders, McKenna Tweedy, Six Awkward Nine, Tuzi Trin, Anthony Ruiz, Peter Mina, Steamed Nuggets, Can't I Potter? And yes, I can! Web design by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Kabamanis. If you want to find us on social media, you can at facebook.com slash potterless, twitter.com slash potterless pod, instagram.com slash potterless podcast, or reddit.com slash r slash potterless. 
for any and all information about the show, you can go to potterlesspodcast.com. For bonus content, you can go to patreon.com slash potterless. And for merch, you can go to bit.ly slash merch on. If you want to tell a friend about the show or leave a review online, that really helps a ton. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on!